I have quite a different type of message tonight, but I believe it's one that, well, the Spirit of God dropped it into my heart several uh, weeks ago, and it just kept uh, not really growing, but kept uh, the, the heartbeat of it just kept throbbing in my spirit. And so I'm going to share that with you tonight. And um, it feels kind of awkward to be uh, the crowd we have. So maybe I ought to do this. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to make these guys over here feel like they're left out or they're liable to. You don't have to move over there. Amen. Thanks for offering. Amen. Uh, I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 27, verse 15. Acts, chapter 27. And verse 15. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read one verse of Scripture to you, and then we're going to get into the message and let the Lord speak to our hearts. Amen. Acts 27, verse 15. And when the ship was caught, now on that ship was 276 criminals, prisoners. And along with those 276 prisoners, prisoners including was Apostle Paul. The master of the ship and the ship master was there. And the Bible says and when the ship was caught, well what did the ship get caught on? Well it gets caught in a storm. And the Bible says and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind we let her drive. We let her drive. I'm I'm going to dedicate this message to all the ladies in this room. Sometimes you just have to let her drive. You may be seated. To all our ladies, sometimes you just have to let her drive. It is a, a time in which all of us are facing uncertainty in our life. And sometimes we face things that we'd rather not face. Whether you're, no matter what your age, no matter who you are, there are things that we have to endure and things that we have to face that we don't necessarily enjoy. But, I mean, you know, God gives us the stick to ism to make it through anything. If you allow Jesus Christ to be strong in your life, He'll give you stick to ism to make it through anything. I don't even know if stick to ism is a word, but it sounds, sounds good right there. But anyway, Apostle Paul. And along with the other prisoners, which were the total of 276 prisoners, must be a pretty good sized ship to haul 276 prisoners in uh, from, in fact, they were at Crete and they were going to Rome to where Caesar was and Paul was going to be tried by King Caesar. But anyway, it was in the time in which storms would come. It was in, it was a time of hurricane season, a time of, uh, of, of storms coming in and because they didn't like the port where the ship was there in Crete they wanted to launch out and Paul told them if you set sail I fear for the ship and I fear for the lives of those on board he said I would recommend that you not set forward not set sail and go but the winter here here in the port of Crete and, of course, the, the master, the ship master, the owner of the ship says, our ship can endure anything, you know. Uh, we'll do all right, and we're going to go, and we're not going to listen to the man of God. How many would agree that Apostle Paul was the man of God? And they said, we're not going to listen to the man of God. Uh, we, we'll make it fine. We're tough. We're strong. We can get it across the water. We can make it. We are seamen. We can get through uh, the adversity. We can, we can make it. Amen. And let me say this real quickly. If you think you can handle life on your own, you're dumb as a box of rocks. If you think you can handle the pressures and the things in your life by yourself, then you are sadly deceived. And the truth is we need each other. But the only one that we can truly trust is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Paul warned them, if you go, uh, there could be people killed. I fear for life and fear for the ship. And the ship master and the captain said, no, we're going to go anyway. And how I many know when you disobey God's word and you say, I'm going to go anyway, 
You can just, just get ready for a horrific storm in your life. Get ready for things to begin to fall apart in your life. You cannot, ban, uh, you cannot burn the candle of life um, all your life uh, for the devil and then blow the fire out and the smoke in God's face at the end of your life. That's not the way it works. We need God and we need to serve God. And so they launched out and they began to go forward. And the Bible says that when the south wind blew softly, they thought, man, we got it made. We achieved our goal. Apostle Paul don't know what he's talking about. And all of a sudden, after a soft east wind had been settling in, had been coming in, um, that south wind coming in, uh, they thought they achieved their goal. But what happened was that a horrific wind came down upon the sea and they were caught in the storm. And the Bible says here in verse 27, or chapter 27, verse 15, that when the ship was caught and could not, you know, it's caught and could not bear up into the wind, that they let her drive. Now, there's a great lesson in this, and I want you to listen to me carefully because there's some things out of your control. Let me say that again. There's some things out of your control. And this was one of those things that was out of the seamen's control. They couldn't, the ship couldn't bear up with the wind. It was too hard. And what was happening, the wind was twisting the ship, coming against it, and the ship couldn't hold up with the sails that had been set for the flight, the, the travel by, by the sails, and it couldn't uphold the wind because the ship was being bent and twisted. And so they pulled the sails down, and they just said, okay, we're done. Uh, it was probably a ship too big for oars, so they probably didn't have oars uh, in the ship, but they pulled the sails down, and they just said, okay, we're just going to let her drive. Just let the ship go where the ship's going to go. Just let it go. Let her drive. Amen. And I want to say right from the start today that sometimes you just have to trust God. It may look bad on your right, look horrible on your left. It may look bad in the front and behind you. It may look like everything is coming against you, and, and, and so it is. There may be all kinds of things that are troubling you. But the truth is, sometimes you just have to give your life and just bear it over into the hand of God. And that's what these sailors do. They finally just had to take their hands off of it and say, okay, we're going to let the ship just let her drive. Now, let me say, uh, first of all, the first thing I want to say is, if, if I could, I would never let her drive. And I'm not talking about my wife now. But if I could, I would never let her drive. They let the ship drive on its own. They just let, let it go because they, it couldn't endure. In fact, their wrestling with the sails would have capsized the ship and I want you to know something there's times in your life you've got to take your hands off of it because if you try to fix it you're going to sink to the bottom and so these sailors were smart enough to keep their hands off of it and they let her drive if it was my, you know, if it was my decision I would never let her drive I would never be in a position where I wasn't in control. I would never be in a position where I couldn't do nothing. I'd never be in a, if it was my choice, I would never just say, okay, whatever be, whatever, it, you know, it is what it is, whatever happens, happens. I, if, if it was my choice, I'd say, that is bad theology. But how many know God does his best work when you weren't even around? Amen? He created the heavens and the earth and we weren't even around. He created the oceans and the land. He created the Milky Way, the, the, the quasars, the galaxies, the universe, and we wasn't even around. In fact, he came to earth, robed himself in the flesh of his son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ, God among us, and God in Jesus Christ, reconciled the world unto himself. We weren't even around yet. But Jesus Christ came and took care of what we could not put our hands on. Jesus put his hands on, and I don't want to go into the storm. I don't want to face the pressures. I don't want to face the heartbreak and the, and the, and the uncertainty, but 
Life is made up of a lot of uncertainties and life is made up of some times that we have no control. But if you'll put your heart and face your spirit toward God and if you'll put your trust in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God will bring you through. God will get you through this. Amen. Well, I'll fix it. No, you'll sink it to the bottom. Well, I'll do this and I'll do that. Wrong. Unless God tells you to do something, hands off. Amen. Now, I don't know whether you like the song or not, but years ago they came out with a song that hit the charts, not only in Christian circle, but also the secular circle. And it's a song going... Jesus, take the wheel. Honest with you, I didn't ever care for that song because, well, first of all, there was a lot of people singing it couldn't sing. Jesus, take the wheel. Well, it isn't that, it isn't that I'm not okay with Jesus taking the wheel, but he needs to take more than the wheel. He needs to take the whole ship. He, na- he needs to take our whole journey into the next world and into the next life. And so they let that ship drive. Guess what happened? That ship crashed or it, 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 it beached, it hit the rock in an island called Claudia. And the ship was really banged up when they hit that island called Claudia. And the Bible says that they had a lot of work to do to repair the ship. There was, a, there was much work to do. And how many know when, when you have a life upset, there's much work to do. Trust God out in the open sea. Trust God when you can't fix things. When, you're, when your feet can't touch the bottom, leave it alone. They're out to sea. Their feet can't touch the bottom. Leave it alone. But when you find yourself beached on the shore, then God says, okay, let's start picking up the debris. Let's start cleaning up the mess. They start putting things back together. And they had much work to do at Claudia. And when they got the old ship put back together, the storm was still beating fiercely. And it was still slamming the ship against the rocks in the island of Claudia. And finally, they got it put together and repaired enough that they launched back out into the sea again. And after they launched back out into the sea again, the Bible says that the storm was so hideous and so dark and bleak that they neither, neither saw the sun or the moon or the stars for many days. The Bible says that it was so bad that they lost all hope of being saved. They got so scared that they couldn't eat. They got so fearful that they couldn't, couldn't enjoy life. They were terrified. And Apostle Paul disappears. There's a long absence in Paul. He's gone. They don't know where he is, but he's down, nestled on his knees somewhere, talking to God. And while Apostle Paul's talking to God and everybody else's life was falling apart and they seen no stars or no sun or no moon for many days and all hope was gone, Apostle Paul spent time talking to God. Guess what? Jesus Christ showed up and appeared before Apostle Paul. And he told Apostle Paul, cheer up. Cheer up, you're going to go see Caesar, you're going to make it to Rome, and no one's going to die on this ship, and no one's going to get hurt, and not a hair on their head's going to be injured or wounded or, or taken or harmed. And he said, it'll be okay. And so Paul goes to the men on that ship, most of them old mean and, and horrible and, 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 and dangerous prisoners, and Paul says, cheer up, Jesus appeared, for me, uh, appeared to me, uh, the Bible says uh, uh, an angel of God in whose I am, uh, whose I belong to. And he said, the Lord has told me that there'll be no harm to us. Cheer up, cheer up, good news. He said, I believe God. Well, that's what makes churches wonderful, people who believe God. That's what makes Wednesday night service and the preacher, yeah, I believe God. You don't want to listen to somebody preach that don't believe God. And we come and we believe God. And Paul says, I believe God. I believe it will be exactly the way he said. And he tells them, eat something. Eat something, be encouraged. You're going to be okay. And the Bible says that it was so fierce, the storm, that they were approaching some other country. 
And the Bible says it was at midnight they approached some other country in the ship in, the, in that storm. Verse 27, chapter 27, verse 27. About midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And I want you to know it's about midnight. And I feel that we're drawing near to a new country. I'm talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. We are at midnight hour in America. We're at midnight hour on planet Earth. And I believe that we are approaching some other country. It's called heaven. It's called Jesus Christ coming to receive his own into himself. And so they sounded and they decided that they were getting very close to land. And because they had sounded, and, and, and that don't mean they blew a horn and listened to the echo come back from the land. It means they put a, a rope, a cord down, and they dropped it down into the water. And however many notches come up, it showed them how deep they were. So they knew that they were coming to land. And it terrified them because they knew that if they got close to the land with all the, the, the choppy water and all the storms, they knew that if they got close to the land, that the, the ship would be thrusted into the rocks and be beaten and busted apart. And so what they did is they saw a river flowing into this island. It was a river branching off the sea. And it says where the, where the way two ways meet. It was where two ways meet, our way and God's way, heaven way and, and earth way. And they said when they saw the two ways meet, they, they wanted to navigate into that place. But before they did that, the Bible says they dropped down four anchors. And those four anchors they dropped and they wished for the day. Because see, it was too dark to do anything. And so they didn't know what they were doing, so they wished for the day. And while they wished for the day with those four anchors down, what were those anchors for? They were to keep, it was to keep the ship from being beat against the rocks and busted apart. And, they, and the Bible says they dropped four anchors down from the stern of the ship and those four anchors would go down to the bottom and grab hold of the bottom and keep that ship from being bashed against the stones and the rocks. Well, the thing is the ship was getting beat up pretty bad, but the Bible says they wished for the day. And uh, I wish for the day for Jesus Christ to return. I've got my anchors down. I'm wishing for the day. I've been beat up pretty bad. I'm wishing for the day. Anybody in this room been beat up pretty bad? I've been beat up pretty bad, and I'm wishing for the day. They put down four anchors. I can name them anchors. Faith, hope, and charity, and a whole lot of praying. That's them four anchors. I name them faith, hope, and charity, and a whole lot of praying. And that's what I'm doing. I've got faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and love, and a whole lot of praying in my life. And the Bible says they wish for the day. When they wish for the day, when the daylight came and it finally, there was a, a way where they could see, that's when they saw this river flowing into this island. And when this river was flowing into this island, the Bible says it was where two ways meet. This is all found in the 27th chapter of the book of Acts. And so what they did is they pulled their anchors. The ship had already beat, been beat to pieces, but they, they, they pulled up. Did you know rivers run through the ocean? Did you know that? Rivers run through the ocean. Job called them the paths in the ocean. They found out that there were channels in the ocean. Ships, like uh, J.R. will know what I'm talking about. Ships would get out to the sea, Atlantic or Pacific. They have ways they go they don't just launch out in the water and just go they have charts where they're going because there's easier places to sail in the sea than others because there's rivers there's channels in them even in the sea there's channels the bible says that there's channels there's paths in the sea and so when they saw the this river where two two ways meet they loosed and let it just thrust into the into the river and when the ship thrusted into the two ways where two, where, where two ways meet. And let me say right now, we're living in where the place where two ways meet. There's heaven and earth. There's two ways right now. And when the ship thrusted into the river, it busted up. And it was far enough from land still that they had, some of them had to jump out and swim to shore. 
Some of them had to get on wooden uh, pieces of the ship and, and float to shore. But they, and by the way, the captain, the master of the ship was going to kill them. But because of Apostle Paul, they said he, he wasn't going to kill them and they survived. And all 276 passengers made it onto the island with the shipmaster, with the, with the owner of the ship. They made it on the island and they all made it safe and sound. I want you to know that we too are having things busted up all around us. And some of us may, some of us, some of us may be so spiritually, powerfully, incredibly powerful that we just ski into the next world. Some of us may be so supernatural and so powerful that you'll just walk on water into the next world. We ain't got none of, none of them in this church, but there's probably some in other churches that think they could. Amen? Now me, I've got down on a piece of board and I'm floating in. And that piece of board that I'm floating in on is called the Cross of Calvary. And I'm, I'm riding the Cross of Calvary into the land, into the shore, with a way where two ways meet. And my life may be busted up, but you know, I learned early on that sometimes we just have to let her drive. Now, what do you mean by letting her drive? I'm talking about the providence of God, the divine providence of God. God has a plan for your life. Everybody in this room, God has a plan for your life. And God's divine providence may allow you to go through some storms. It may allow you to go through some really hard times in your life. But God's divine providence is that you and I be winners. That we survive. That we know Christ. That's God's divine providence. Now some won't get on that and they'll, they won't make heaven their home. But we as Christians know that we can trust the divine providence of God. Amen. And sometimes we need to just let the ship drive. Let her drive. Just let her drive. And once again, I would say I would never let her drive. Or I would, I would escape the storm at all costs. I'd like to escape the storm. How many in this room would like to just forget that storm business? It's done with that. Amen. But let me read a scripture to you in verse 55, or Psalm chapter 55, verse 8. And the psalmist felt the same way. He'd like to just skip the storm. And the psalmist said, I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and the tempest. But I mean, no, you can't escape from it. If you could, you'd run from it. But you can't. The storm will come. But let me say this. In Psalm 103, verse 16 and 17, here's what it says. For the wind passes over it, speaking of our life, the wind passes over our life, passes over it, and it is gone. The wind's gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto chil the children's children. Now let me, let me just peg this. The Bible says that storms will come and they'll pass over our life, and they'll pass over our life and be gone. And, and it'll be done. It, it won't return again. There'll just be a storm, and it'll go over our lives, and it'll be done. But God's everlasting from everlasting mercy is ours. We can trust God, and it's not just for us. It's for our children's children. That God is a good God, and he loves our children's children. From generation to generation, God is going to watch over us. Amen? So I guess the second point of the message simply would be this. There's never been a storm so big or never been a storm that was bigger than God. Do you hear me? There's never been a storm bigger than God. And I, let me say this again. There's never been a storm so big that it doesn't blow out. Hello? Hello? Never been a storm so big that it doesn't blow out. And so we need to understand that there will be storms in our life, but God will, will take us through. God will bring us through. God will help us get through the storms of life. And he will take us where we need to be. Amen. It's called the providence of God. I don't always want, you know, I don't always, well, in fact, I don't want to ever let her drive. I don't want to ever face a storm, but the storms come anyway. 
And I desire not to have them storms in my life. Amen. But I'm thankful for the fact that God has a plan. And no matter what the storms are in our life, God will take us through and God will watch over us. Amen. Come on. I was thinking here in, in, in the uh, storm that came, that the worst storm of all that came upon the people. Uh, Ep Epicodon, I believe was how you pronounce that storm that's coming or that did come upon the ship. But let me just simply peg it like this. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. All things work together for good to them that are called. Them that are the called, the Bible says. And so I am, I am part of the called. And I love God. The Bible says all things work together for good to them that are the called of God. Because God has a purpose for our life. And so sometimes you just got to let her drive. Let the grace of God drive. Sometimes you just got to say, look, my life's not exactly what I'd like for it to be, but I'm going to trust God. You know, I, I'm, th this thing's out of my control. I've got to let God take full control of it. I'm sure that some of you have had families that were really sick. My mother was, before she went on uh, to be with the Lord, she was so sick, and it was beyond my control. My mother had tremendous pain in the last few hours of her life. It was beyond my control. I prayed and prayed and prayed that she would not suffer, but there was, there was tremendous pain involved in the tearing of that veil and my mother going on to be with the Lord. And that was something I couldn't handle. I just had to put it in God's hands. And we can't always, we can't always uh, uh, keep everything under control. Sometimes we, but the main thing we need to do is when we don't have everything in, the con uh, in control, don't you go out of control. When you don't have everything in control, trust God. Don't you go out of control. Don't you lose it because you haven't got it. Did you get me? Don't you lose it because you haven't got it. And when I mean lose it, I mean daffy duck stupid. And some of you don't know what I'm talking about, so you're too young to know Daffy Duck. But anyway, I knew Daffy Duck. He was really dumb. Talk about a dumb duck. He's really a dumb duck. Amen. Come on. And so we sometimes just have to let the Lord just take care of it. Now let me come to the last part of the message. And I just want to say not all winds are bad. Did you hear what I said? Not all winds are bad. In fact, I got caught up in a wind, and the wind was the Spirit of God. When I was 23 years old, I got caught up in a wind, and that wind was the Spirit of God. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is likened to a wind? And here's what it says in John chapter 3, verse 8. It says, The wind bloweth where it listeneth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it go cometh, and whether it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Amen? And so there was a wind that came. And that wind came. And it was not a south wind blowing gently, as the Scripture says in Acts chapter 27, it wasn't, it wasn't a soft, gentle south wind thinking I achieved my goal. It was a wind that convicted me. And I didn't think I achieved my goal. In fact, I discovered that I had not achieved my goal. When the Spirit of God came on me and convicted me, and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life, and I was willing enough to quit some things if Jesus would just take over. That's what you call true repentance. Get this out of your head. Don't think you go forward and, and take my hand and say, I do now receive Jesus as my 
personal Savior. Oh, isn't Jesus really fortunate to be your Savior? That's sarcasm. You know what it is. Isn't Jesus so blessed to have you? Get that turned around. Amen? I hear preachers say all the time, would you please come to Jesus? Just come to Jesus and just receive him in your heart. Well, I don't see that. I don't see that invitation in the book of Revelation. I see that invitation in the church by Jesus Christ. And he says, repent or else I will come quickly and remove the candlestick out of your place. Repent. Do the first works over. Repent. Turn to God. And no one can do that without that wind blowing. Not all winds are bad. The winds of the Holy Ghost is good. Not all storms is bad. Some of the storms that take away our confidence and we start trying to, we start putting confidence in Jesus Christ. That wind came. And when that wind came in my life at 23 years old, God blew everything that I didn't have nailed down, he blew away. And everything that I did have nailed down, he pulled the nails out. I thought, Jesus, aren't you so fortunate? I quit drinking. And the Lord said, they ain't all you're going to quit. I remember when I first got saved, boy, Jesus, aren't you fortunate? I quit smoking. And the Lord says, they ain't all you're going to quit. Well, Jesus, aren't you, aren't you so fortunate? I quit, uh, you know, looking at ladies wrong. And Jesus said, that ain't all you're going to quit. And Jesus said to me, in fact, you're not only going to quit those things, you're going to die. Die to the world and live to Jesus Christ. These new saccharine sweet churches today, and I don't want this church to ever be saccharine sweet. I'd rather it be a little bit on the sour side. I'd rather our church be just a little bit on the raw side, just a little bit on the salty side, just a little bit on the, uh, on the harsh side, just a little bit on the, uh, on the uh, uh, fervent side, the hot side, and to be so smooth that people come to church and they're comfortable in living in sin, and people come to church, and they, they don't come to church to really hear from the Lord. They come to church to be entertained. I want to hear that special uh, program. I want to see that special program. Well, it's not the program that the church puts together. It's the program of God. His son died on the cross of Calvary, shed his blood for our sin, was buried and rose again from the grave, and that's the only program of God that's going to save our soul. Now, don't misunderstand me. Church ought to be interesting, and church ought to be thrilling. And, and I realize tonight I've got one hand tied behind my back and, and half my tongue tied up tonight because of the weather and because of the, uh, the circumstances. But you know what? That one thing that God hammered in my spirit and has been hammering in my spirit is let her drive. See, there were some things in my life this week that I wanted to really, I just wanted to let the steam out. There were some things that happened in my life this week that I just wanted to get on the keyboard and say some things on Facebook. I wanted to get on the telephone and say some things. And the Lord said, don't you do a thing. And he brought me to that scripture where the ship was released, the sails were brought down, and the Lord Jesus said, let her drive. Just let her drive. Just let her drive. And sometimes you just got to let her drive. Just leave it alone. Get your hands off of things. Get your mouth out of things. Get your mind out of things. And just allow the Lord to take you wherever he's taken you. And I promise you, wherever he's taken you, he's going to take you to a place where you've got to work and there's a lot of labor to do and a lot of work to be done. 
But he, he's, going, he's going to take you to that other country. And I'm glad that Jesus Christ came into my life and saved my soul. And I'm glad today that when that wind came, when I got saved, God hit me so hard, I, I said, what happened? When I got saved, the Lord just chopped me up in pieces everywhere. I mean, he just, he just took care of me. When God dealt with me, he dealt with my spirit. And by the way, he dealt with me hard because I'm going to preach my first sermon three weeks after I'm saved. I'm going to preach my first revival six weeks after I'm saved. So he, caught, he just cut me up in little pieces and put me here and put me there and put me here and put me there. And there's deep conviction in my spirit. And God says, yeah, you're going to quit drinking, but that's not all you're going to do. You're going to quit cursing, and that's not all you're going to do. He said, you're not only going to quit doing some things, you're going to start doing some things. And I said, start doing what? He said, read my Bible, read my book, learn about my son." Go to my church, be baptized, preach my gospel. I found out that God had a whole lot of things for me to do and not just a whole lot of things for me to quit doing, had a whole lot of things for me to start doing. And when God chopped me up in a thousand pieces, I could just hear God say, it'd be easier just to make a new one. And that's what God did. He just made a new he made a new me. He just made a new me. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Did you know that new creature means something that has never existed before? God made Adam and Eve. But we're not like Adam and Eve. God created the animals. And we're not like the animals. God created the fowls there, and we're not like the fowls there. And, and despite what atheists say, we're not like monkeys either. Been around some that act like them, but another, we're not monkeys. We're different. We're a different species. We're, we're different. We're not, when, when we got born again, when God takes us to heaven, we're not going to be like Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve was made out of dust. We're going to be made out of the spiritual, resurrected body of Jesus Christ, His Word, His Gospel, His Spirit, His life, His blood. In fact, the dirty part of us won't even be included in our new bodies. Come on, isn't that good? Come on. And so when the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, he's saying that we are something that never existed before. Adam and Eve were made out of dirt. God breathed into their nostrils the breath of life, at least Adam. And from Adam's side came Eve. And we know that they were made in the image of God. And we thank God for that. They are our fathers back then. And they sinned and fell. And because of his fall, our first Adam's fall, we all have the fallen nature. But because the last Adam come along, his name is Jesus Christ. He wasn't, he wasn't made out of the the same substance that Adam and Eve was made out of. He came from his, his a mother, a virgin womb, and God is his father, and the blood that pumped through the body of Jesus Christ was God's blood. And so when we're given our new body, we, we're new creatures. We're not made of the stuff that Adam and Eve was made out of. We're made of the stuff that the last Adam was made out of. And we're made out of the Holy Ghost and the blood of Jesus Christ and the Word of God and the Spirit of God and the purpose of God. We're made out of eternal things. You and I sitting in this room, we are made out of eternal substance. And that means we are different from any other creature. We're different from the angels. We're different from Adam and Eve in the beginning because we're made of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good? Amen. I'm so glad that I... I'm glad that I don't believe in that evolution. How many glad you don't believe in evolution? You know... I don't believe in evolution because I don't want people to think I'm that dumb. 
I mean, if they're going to think I'm dumb, at least think I'm dumb for other reasons, not something so crazy as that. The professor says, I once was a tadpole, long and thin. Then I was a bullfrog with my tail tucked in. Then I was a monkey swinging from a tree. And now I'm a professor with a Ph.D. I don't buy that monkey business. Amen? I don't buy that. I had a guy, I knocked on the door in Nixa, and, and I'm doing like Chuck. I hope I ain't preaching too long, Pastor. And, and I knocked on the door in Nixa, and, and uh, the guy came to the door, and I said, I want to invite you out to the house of the Lord. I want to, uh, can I share some good news with you for a few moments? He looked at me and said, what are you? I said, I'm a preacher, and I want to share Christ. He said, I don't believe in that. I'm an atheist. And I said, you're an atheist. He said, I am. He said, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. And I said, hold on just a minute. And I walked out there in his yard, and I picked a blade of grass. I walked up to him and held it up in his face, and I said, explain this to me, and then tell me you're an atheist. He said, well, I can't explain that to you. I said, then you're dumber than I thought. Because I can explain it to you. God made every blade of grass. Amen. And I said, if you think you're an atheist and think there's no God, every time you walk out there to your car and walk through the grass, you're walking on miracles of God that God created. And you're getting in a car, and he happened to have a Toyota. I said, you're going to get in that Toyota. And it came about by some... Some, some explosion in a spring factory. I said, that car wasn't made by anybody. That car just happened. He said, okay, get out of my yard. Now, I realized that I wasn't doing the way I should do, but it just burns me up when someone starts talking about my God like that. I mean, I, I needed kicked out of his yard. I deserved being kicked out of his yard. I deserved being asked to leave. I did. I did not behave myself. And when I got out of his yard and got in my car, the Lord said, boy, you sure were glorious then, weren't you? And, and, and that wasn't a compliment. When the Lord said, boy, you were glorious then, that wasn't God compliment me. God was saying, you know, that could have been handled a little bit different. And I said, Lord, forgive me for having fun. Amen. We're going to give an invitation. And I want to ask you the question. Has that wind of the Holy Ghost, has that good storm came in your life and changed you and brought you to a place where you can trust your Lord and Savior, and Jesus Christ, as your Savior and your Lord? Stand with me. Amen. If you see anybody that didn't come to church tonight, you see them during the week, tell them you got a full meal. meal. In fact, you got two, uh, you got two meals on wheels, Chuck and me. And you can tell them that you received the blessing of the Lord. Amen. And if they ask you what the preacher preached, tell him, say, he preached, let her drive. Sometimes you just have to let her drive. Ward. Sometimes you just have to let her drive. Michael, sometimes you just have to let her drive. <laughs> Dan, never mind. There are, there are limitations. JR, sometimes you just have to let her drive. Well, that's some more limitations there. Amen. I see Dave all the time now that he's got married and Goldie, Goldie taxes, taxes him around. Oh, oh Dave, he's, he, uh, Dave's a hot shot. He got married. He's got a wonderful wife. And when Dave goes out there, now he probably would drive out of here tonight after me saying what I just said. But I've been seeing Goldie drive. And Dave's just riding around like this. Amen. He just struts out there in the car like this. And Goldie runs around to the right side, opens the door, and Dave just steps in.
sits down. Now, well, it ain't exactly like that, but close. And Dave loves it. Now, when Judy drives, my wife, yeah, she drives a piano better than she drives a car. And when Judy drives, I don't do this. I do this. And don't misunderstand me, she's a good driver, but I'm a bad rider. Amen? Because they wait too long to break or they wait too long to take off. We're going to give an invitation. I, my question is, are you ready? My question, are you ready? Are you willing to let God, are you willing to let it drive? Are you willing to let the grace of God guide you when, you're, when you can't do anything about it? Are you willing to let it drive? Let God drive. Let her, let her drive. Let the Spirit of God, let the grace of God guide your life. Are you ready for that? The altar's open. You come.